give us hearts that are good soil for your word, that we may bear fruit, your fruit in our lives. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Um, before I start, I'd just like to say a big thank you for those of you who were here on Tuesday. Um, I spoke to Jim on Wednesday and told him the whole church had been praying for him, and he said since then he has been feeling better. So thank you. He values your prayers and would value you to continue to pray until he gets safely back to the UK. This week we'll see the opening of the bakery that many of you have supported over the last year or so. So it's a time of celebration and a time of personal worry for him, but he is very grateful, so thank you for that. So, um, wow, there is so much in this. Um, it's an incredible passage, but I think it's always, when you read scripture in isolation, it's always good to kind of see where it fits with everything else. And of course, as we've um, spoken about on the Tuesday night a few weeks ago when we were here, uh, Glyn very rightly said that when we look at scripture, we look at it through our own life experience and we look at it from the bits that have touched us in our lives. So the, m the message I bring you this morning is what I feel that the Lord has laid on my heart to, to give to you. What I would encourage you to do individually is actually to read the scripture and just see what it says to you personally, because for each one of us, it may be different. There may be something that jumps out of you. So we have a, a scene here where Jesus is with his friends. He's in a social setting. He's having a meal. This meal is being held in his honor. Now, if you look back to when we first meet Martha and Mary in Luke 10, Jesus and his disciples um, come to the house of Martha where she welcomes them in. And there's that beautiful scene where Mary is at the feet of Jesus and Martha is busy doing what Martha does. And then she comes in and she says, Lord, don't you care? My sister's letting me do everything. Tell her to help me. I think that is an incredible thing for anyone to say to Jesus. Tell her to help me. And he has that beautiful, gentle rebuke that says to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried about so many things. You know, don't worry. There's only one or two things you need to worry about. And Mary's got it. She's chosen what's better. And it reminds me of that scripture in Matthew 6, where it talks about by worrying, we can't add a day to our lives. By being fearful, it achieves nothing that we should seek first the kingdom of God. And then everything is added to us. Yeah? So that is the first time we meet in the Bible, Martha and Mary in Luke 10. So we have that idea of the dynamic between the two sisters. Lazarus isn't mentioned in that particular um, section of scripture. And then when we move on to John 11, just before we come to chapter 12, where today's reading comes from, of course, we hear about the death of Lazarus. And this is a really interesting story in itself because Lazarus is ill. So the sisters call for Jesus. They tell him, they send him a message, Lord, the one you love is sick. And he stays put. He stays where he is. And you think, well, that's an odd thing to do. The disciples must have thought, oh, well, there can't be that much to worry about then. He's staying put. That's okay. And then after a while, Jesus says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to wake him up. And the disciples say, well, if he's just asleep, then when he wakes up, he'll feel better. And then Jesus has to say to him, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. For your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. So you may believe. Interesting, isn't it? There was a point to everything Jesus did. There's a point to everything Jesus does. And then he arrives. He arrives, we know the story, it's very familiar, but both sisters say, Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. You could have saved him if you'd have been here. But of course, he didn't need to be there because the whole point was the fact that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days at this point. He had to be absolutely dead, if that makes sense. <laughs> absolutely certain. Um, to then perform the miracle and raise him back to life. 
so that people would believe. Time was getting short at this point. It was getting very short. And Jesus knew that. But I think even at this point, people didn't fully appreciate what was still about to come. And very quickly. So after that, of course, there's already a plot to kill Jesus. We can't have people raising people from the dead because that puts our our personal ministries at risk. We can't have this. We have to stop it. So they looked for a way to kill him and plotted at that point. And that's when we come back to Bethany. So it's six days before the Passover. Jesus has come to Bethany and they're having dinner. And all the usual suspects are there. So Martha's serving. It just says in this, I love this, Martha served. She didn't complain. She didn't say anything. She served. You wonder whether that previous encounter, whether she really felt the true conviction of what Jesus was saying to her, that actually, you know, to serve is great. And that there is no doubt that both these sisters loved Jesus. They both trusted him. They both had a relationship with him but in very different ways, on different levels. And it manifested itself very differently. And um, I think it's true to say that in this room, we have scores of people whose faith is outworked in a very different and personal way. And there is merit in all that we do. But what Jesus is looking at is our heart and our attitude. It doesn't matter how busy we are. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how many Bible studies we go to. It's about the attitude of our heart that he's interested in. And in this section of scripture, it says, Martha served. And I would guess she served gratefully and joyfully. Her brother had been raised from the dead. This was in Jesus' honor. I think it would have been a very different type of service at this point. I'd almost like to be a fly on the wall to see what that looks like. And Lazarus was there reclining. At the t- I love that, reclining at the table, which was the custom. And you just wonder what those conversations were like. Well, what was it like then? What's it like to be dead? Wouldn't You would ask that, right? I'm not the only one that would ask that question. You know, what was it like? What did it feel like? What was the first thing you remember? What was the last thing you remember? There must have been scores and scores of questions going on and trying to find out what it's like because we all have that what's it going to be like kind of thing in the back of our minds because we're eventually all going to know aren't we and we're eventually going to know all of the answers so he's there with the greatest testimony to tell and share with his friends but that's kind of played down in this but I can imagine that that was the talk that was going on it's bound to be It's just natural. We are by our pure nature. We want to know. We want to know everything. What's it like? What was going on? And then Mary comes in with a Avon. (coughs) But not quite. And you can just picture the scene. And as I read this, and I've read this, as you can imagine, a few times over the last few um, weeks since it was given to me, um, I've read it and read it and read it. And I just think, then enters Mary stage left. So everybody's having a meal. There's a lot of chatter. There's probably wine, you know, so there's a lot of chatter. There's food. And then Mary comes in and she just does something that is totally unexpected. It's totally out of the ordinary and totally outrageous. It's completely outrageous what she does. And she comes to Jesus with her nod and she pours it over his feet over his head over his whole body it doesn't really matter but through that act of worship it's almost like she is just pouring out herself now there is a lot of debate about Mary and who she is is she Mary Magdalene isn't she I don't think it matters whether she is or not But if she is, and it makes sense to me that she might be, here is a woman who has led a very, very simple life and completely understands what it is to be forgiven. Completely understands 
what the redemption and salvation Jesus offers us is. She just gets it. And she comes to him in this scene of complete intimacy in the middle of a crowded room. And this exchange takes place. And she anoints him with her year's wages worth of perfume. Now, if we were there having dinner and somebody comes in and does that, suddenly there's not going to be anyone talking. Everyone's going to be focused on what's going on there. Some people are going to feel really uncomfortable. Some people are going to feel really outraged. Judas voices that. Some people aren't going to understand at all. But for some people, after what's happened, what's gone on before, they might just get it. That this is about coming to Jesus as we are. This is about giving Jesus all of us and not holding anything back. Just giving ourselves in entirety, warts and all, everything. We're never going to be perfect, not this side of heaven. We can't be perfect. But we can give Jesus what we've got. What does he want from us? He wants us. He doesn't ask us for anything else. He wants us. He wants us to want him more than anything. If you've ever been in love, you know that that kind of feeling where you just want to do anything. You'll do anything. You'd walk on broken glass. You'd, you know, you'd do anything. My dad tells the story of, um, and it, it makes my Kirsty laugh, of when he first courted my mum that he walked all the way from Dunstable to Luton in the snow there and back for half an hour with my mum. You know, in the days when we got proper snow, you know, the, the, the two-foot kind. And my Kirsty goes, oh, Granddad, you must really have loved Nana. You must really have loved her to do that. And he goes, she's all right. She's all right. <laughs> You know, but they've, they've been married 52 years now, so I think she's a bit better than all right. But when you love somebody, you just want the best for them. You want to bring out the best for them. You want relationship, and that's what Jesus is calling us to do. And that is what this story is all about. It's about giving to Jesus of ourselves and sacrificially. It's about pouring ourselves out. It's about being available. It's about relationship. I mean, that was a pretty expensive bottle of perfume. Where did she get the money from to buy it? It would make sense if she'd lived an immoral life that she was giving back what she had been cleansed from, if you like. That she was totally aware of where she'd come from, but that she sat at Jesus' feet, knowing that it didn't matter, that she was forgiven. And what a great reward if you fast forward, that if it is the same Mary, she's the first one to see the resurrected Jesus. That's why it makes sense to me, it's one and the same. But it doesn't matter, we can argue, theologians logians have argued about it, and I'm no theologian, but we could argue that point but it makes complete sense that this could be the same Mary or a Mary of similar background even. There are lots of Marys in the Bible. But just that journey that she's come and when we first meet her in the context of her relationship with her sister, that she's sat at the feet of Jesus, that she's listening, that she's soaking it up because she knows it's important. And even the disciples that spent three years in close proximity, not all of them have got it, even at this point, even after the cross, some of them don't get it. For us, it should be easy. We've read the book, we know how the story ends. We know it never ends. Isn't that amazing? We know it never ends. We know it's eternity, that we can have that same passion for Jesus that Mary had. We can live with him in eternity as Mary undoubtedly does. We have to make that choice. Who are we going to be for Jesus? How are we going to live our lives for Jesus? Is it the first thing you think of every morning? Now, I'm not judging anyone here. 
don't get me wrong. Is Jesus the thread that runs through your life? If someone cut you in the middle like a stick of rock, what does it say? Is Jesus the center? Because that's where he's called to be. And we've sung worship songs that says, you're all I want, you're all I ever needed. And that is so true. But do we believe it? Do we fully understand the price that was paid for each and every one of us? The hairs on our head are all numbered. We're that precious to God that he, he came himself to sort us out. He gave of himself so completely. And in this scene, for once, he receives back. And that's beautiful. He receives back. And that's what he wants. It's a two-way relationship. It's not just what can Jesus do for us. He's done more than we can ever repay in a million lifetimes. It's about what does he want from us? What is he calling us to do? Are we struggling with a decision? Are we feeling that Jesus is calling us into a ministry or to take a course of action that makes us uncomfortable, that might even make us unpopular? might make us stand out. I mean, Mary wiped his feet with her hair. Jewish women did not let their hair down in public. She broke every taboo. She touched him physically. She let her hair down. It was just complete, complete surrender. Are we ready for that? And some days we might go, yeah, I'm ready for that. And other days we might say, well, maybe not today. And that's okay, because we're all on a journey. And if you think of yourself in that room, where are you? Who are you in that story? It's really useful to read scripture and say, right, if I'm there, who do I most identify with? Because that reveals to us actually where we are in our journey. Who am I identifying with? Am I the one that's busy doing Am I so busy doing? I'm trying to earn my way into heaven. The more I do, the further up the, the faith ladder I get. We all know it doesn't work like that. We know that faith without works is dead too. We do have to do something, but it's not about how busy we are. Do you think you're okay? Are you sitting here today thinking, well, I'm all right. I know Jesus. I pray. I feel the Holy Spirit sometimes. Do you have a tendency to look at other people and what they're doing? Oh, wouldn't do that. Are you the one with the great testimony? If you are, you should share it. There's nothing more edifying and encouraging to other people than to hear a testimony of what Jesus has done. It's very, very powerful. Now, I'm not suggesting anyone here has had the Lazarus experience, but I'm sure there are some pretty mighty testimonies in this room. And I know we've heard some at the ladies' breakfast, and no doubt at the men's breakfast you've done something similar. But actually to acknowledge who Jesus in it is in our life, where we've come from, where we are now, is really, really powerful. Or are you Mary? Have you got to that place? Have you got to that place where Jesus is all that matters? Nothing else matters. Are you living your life as a sacrifice of praise? Is a phrase that's come up a couple of times this morning when we were praying. Are you living your life, everything you do for Jesus? as an act of worship? Do people notice that you're different? By our fruit, they'll know. Yeah? That's how disciples are identified by their fruit. Scripture tells us that. What fruit are we revealing to others? And it's not about getting a Bible and hitting someone over the head with it. It's about how we live. It's how we relate to other people. But if we put Jesus first, if we have that intimacy with Jesus that he calls us to, that Mary demonstrates here so profoundly, 
then we will mirror Jesus to everyone we meet. Because when you love somebody and you spend time with them, you start to mirror them. And you know that's true because any relationship, you will, you'll use phrases that somebody you, you love uses. You, you become, that you understand what they're thinking. You understand exactly what they mean. It's not about the words. It's about the music under the words is a phrase I've often heard. It's not what we say. It's how we say it and what we do alongside that. Words are just a tiny, tiny portion. But action speaks so much louder. And it may just be coming up to somebody in church. You know they've had a bad week. And you just put your hand on their shoulder. And sometimes that's all that's needed. Just for people to know that you know that they need that bit of encouragement. So my encouragement to you today is to just really consider what it means to be in relationship with Jesus. To really consider where you are in your personal journey. And I haven't got there yet. I'm not there yet. But I want to be. I want to be at that place where nothing else matters. Where I don't worry about stuff. Where I would give a year's wages worth of something I had without thinking twice about it. I want to get there. And I think the only way we can do that is to go back to what Jesus said in Matthew 6, where he says in verse 33, that seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So let's just try and put Jesus first.